Normally, we spend a lot of time on this channel talking about news in the United States. Today, we're going to go around the world a little bit and talk about world affairs, global news, because it is important. We're going to start off still in North America, but we're going to talk about Mexico. There is a new story over from the Daily Mail that says asylum seekers who Trump banned from the U.S. stream from the U.S. stream across Gateway International Bridge from Mexico after Biden relaxed the rules there are 500 expected by the end of the week. The first asylum seekers have crossed the Gateway International Bridge from Mexico after Joe Biden overturned Trump's immigration policies. 700 people are, are in a migrant camp near Matamoros, Mexico, just across the river from Brownsville, Texas. They have been crossing in the, into the United States after spending months stuck in Mexico waiting for their cases to be processed. They hope to enter the U.S., by entering the U.S., their cases will be processed faster and it will be more difficult to deport them under the new asylum rules. Trump administration created the Remain in Mexico program January 2019 in an effort to deter the asylum seekers. Donald Trump defended the policies. They sent more than 69,000 people back over the border, sometimes in ramshackle refugee camps, as a way to protect U.S. citizens from thugs and bad hombres. Bad hombres. Remember that? Bad hombres. One week ago, President Joe Biden administration began permitting members of the migrant protection protocols to enter the U.S. to pursue their court cases. Since then, U.N. refugee spokesperson Sylvia Garduno said 27 people crossed the border from Mexico, 100 on Friday, with the remaining 500 or so crossing early next week. So this is a little breakdown of some of the differences in policies. So we've got Trump's policy was known as the migrant protection protocols forced migrants attempting to cross the border to stay in Mexico while they were applying for asylum. Migrants would be held in a staging area. After entering the U.S., they would be taken to local shelters. They would coordinate with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They would uh, avoid detention, but they may be subject to ankle bracelets. Trump implemented the Remain in Mexico policy in 2019, forced immigrants fleeing dangerous situations to stay in Mexico while awaiting court hearings in the U.S. Under the policy, the government removed more than 60,000 migrants to the Mexican border. President Biden's plan will allow migrants waiting, for, uh, waiting at the Mexican border to enter to apply for asylum. First step of ending Trump's policies expected to be officially rolled out in upcoming weeks. Situation at the border will not transform over overnight. Supreme Court also granted the administration's request to cancel an upcoming hearing on the Remain in Mexico policy while the White House weighs a replacement. So, uh, so that's going on. So we'll see how that shakes out. We have sort of two different policies. Trump's was, well, you can come and apply for asylum. And remember what asylum is for. Asylum is for people who are escaping something dangerous. It's not just, uh, you know, well, we just want to be living in the U.S. now. we got to find something that was really wrong in Mexico that justifies going through this immigration proceeding, that justifies acceptance into the United States. Both administrations were processing those claims. However, when Trump was processing them, they stayed in Mexico. While Biden is processing them, they can come into the United States. And the issue here is going to be about sort of enforceability and whether people will actually go and respond to their court dates. I think one of the major underlying issues here, Trump said, well, once they come into the United States, they're gone. We never hear from them again. They're seeking asylum. They don't show back up for court. And so they're effectively non-legal migrants now who are just operating within the United States. They sent something like 69,000 people back, precluded them from coming in. Biden now says, nope, come on in first. We'll process your case while you're here. We'll see what the enforceability looks like. Are they going to show up? Are they going to be able to maintain an engaged asylum-seeking population? We will find out soon. We're going to leave North America. We're going to go over to Asia. We're going to take a look at Russia, what's going on there. A guy by the name of Alexei Navalny. We haven't spoken about him on this channel, but somebody I have been following for some time. This is a Russian opposition politician, somebody who is uh, going directly adverse to Putin. Pooty Poo over there in Russia. And he is somebody with cojones that I got to tell you are, are large, massive. Okay, he was poisoned by Putin, recovered, and then just returned over there knowing that he was going to get a fake show trial and they were going to incarcerate him and probably kill him. 
And now he has been transported to a notorious penal colony that is uh, not good. That's horrendous that he's going to be subject to a lot of discipline. Let's take a look about what's going on in his case. Alexei Navalny. Opposition politician, he's going to serve his prison sentence in a penal colony notorious for disciplinary measures considered harsh, even by Russian standards. Russia's decision to transfer Navalny to a prison known for abusive treatment of inmates came even as the Kremlin faced mounting foreign criticism for the sentencing as well as an assassination attempt on Mr. Navalny last summer. He returned to Russia in January, despite the government's threat of arrest after spending months in a Berlin hospital, recuperating from being poisoned with some radiation. He was convicted in a show trial of violating the terms of his parole during his stay in Germany, sentenced to more than two years in prison in Russia. So I, I, I give our justice system here a lot of grief, right? I want it to improve. I like to sort of poke fun at some of the ridiculousness that we see on a daily basis but by and large it's it's light years beyond stuff that we see elsewhere in the world and this is a good example of it alexei navalny somebody who is pushing forward for what i would call sort of basic democratic reforms in russia has agitated the wrong people the oligarchy there the power structure that exists because of putin and you know his other individuals they are punishing him for trying to make the country a better place. And I think it's a, that's a damn shame. He got a show trial. They attempted to poison him. They convicted him basically as soon as he returned a very, very fast trial, very little evidence, no real due process, no real judicial protections that you would see like we have here, all just gone with the wind. He gets convicted, going to spend two years in a hard labor prison camp and we'll, uh, I'll be very surprised if he survives this. I mean, truthfully, um, I, I'm very hopeful that he does. going to keep him in my prayers, but we'll see where it goes. On Monday, European Union placed sanctions on four senior Russian officials considered responsible for his prosecution. The first time the union has exercised that power under a new law to punish human rights violators worldwide. The officials are Igor Krasnov, Prosecutor General, Alexander Batskrikin. We have... Viktor Zolotov. We also have Alexander Kalishnikov. They're the head of the Russian prison service. Russia was expected to be hit on Monday with another round of criticism with the release of the United Nations report on Mr. Navalny's poisoning and prosecution. Russian prison service has not officially disclosed his whereabouts following the customary Russian practice of keeping inmates incommunicado while in transit, transit and in the first days or weeks at a new prison. Nevertheless, the news reports on state-run outlets offered an early glimpse of the likely conditions of his imprisonment. The site Penal Colony Number no. 2, also known by its acronym IK2, is in the Vladimir region of the European Russian east of Moscow, indicating that Mr. Navalny will not serve his sentence in the country's harshest prisons in the Siberia or the Arctic. So it could be even worse. He's in number two. The colony, however, is known for strict enforcement of the rules, for making extensive use of separate, harsher punishment facility within its walls where inmates are not allowed to, to mingle or to even talk amongst themselves, according to former inmates and lawyers. It's typical for Russian colony-type prisons that evolved from the gulag camps established in the 1930s. Inmates live collectively in groups of several dozen called brigades in low-slung two-story buildings surrounded by walls and barbed wires. Guards oversee the prison. Fellow prisoners maintain discipline within the brigades, either in cooperation with the guards and the group known as activists or with criminal gang leaders known as thieves in law. Penal colony number two is controlled by activists in cahoots with the warden, according to former inmates. An arrangement that will allow the prison administration to strictly control Mr. Novelny's life at all times. Activist controlled prisons are called red zone facilities in Russian prison parlance. Prison is called the reddest of red prisons. Everything is done so a person feels his total dependence on the warden. They're even denied prompt visits from lawyers, which is technically illegal, she said. Everything is done to isolate political prisoners. Dimitri, a national politician who served time in the colony, described conditions in a separate punishment brigade where Novelny could wind up as psychologically harrowing. They must shave every morning. They're not allowed to do so themselves because they are not allowed to hold razors. Instead, activists wield razors and cuts and nicks are common. So you have somebody shaving you with a straight razor. Probably. I'm just right at your throat every day. 
Inmates spend hours standing with their hands clasped behind their backs, looking at their feet, forbidden from making eye contact with the guards, said in an interview. They will find many ways to pressure him. In these conditions, he said, your personality deforms, right? Which is kind of a harrowing statement there, right? Your personality deforms. How can it not if you're in a situation like that? So, you know, I just wanted to point that out. We have a lot of problems in our justice system. We have a lot of problems with our prisons. We have a lot of problems with due process and innocence until proven guilty and all of the other concepts that we talk about here. But uh, fortunately, it's not like that. So we'll keep him in our thoughts as this moves forward. And then we're going to leave Asia and go back over to Europe because the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, was sentenced to jail. What? How does a former president get sentenced to jail? Well, it happened today. We have a Paris court found French former president guilty of corruption and influence peddling on Monday. Now, I was really surprised by this. He was sentenced to a year in prison. And we've talked about this before on this channel. Do presidents go to prison? Do they really? No. And is Nicolas Sarkozy? Probably not. He was sentenced to a year in prison, but he can ask to serve that at home, and he also plans to appeal anyways. So the 66-year-old, who was president from 07 to 2012, convicted of trying to bribe a magistrate, who's a judge, in exchange for information about a legal case that he was implicated in. He will remain free while he appeals. It was a blow to the retired politician who still plays an influential role in French conservative politics. Not the end of his legal tr troubles either. He faces another trial later this month under investigation in a third case. This is the first time in France's modern history that a former president has been convicted of corruption and given a prison term. Predecessor Jacques Chirac was found guilty in 2011 of misuse of public money during his time as Paris, Paris mayor, not considered a corruption offense. He was given a two-year suspended prison sentence, which sounds right. They always get just a little bit of a slap on the wrist. Well, we could send you to prison, but we're not going to do that because you are part of that class, that upper class that controls things. We don't punish those people. So here, a little bit curious because he did get a prison sentence uh, one year, in fact. Now he can do it at home. We'll see where that goes. Court said Sarkozy is entitled to be detained at home with an electronic bracelet for any same situation that anybody gets if it's two years or less. Two years suspended sentence he will not have to serve if he commits no new offense in the next five years. His lawyer said he, he would appeal. And uh, it's... Court said this case was particularly serious. Trial focused on phone calls that took place February 2014. At the time, investigative judges had launched an inquiry into the financing of his presidential campaign. Wiretapped conversations on those phones led prosecutors to suspect Sarkozy and Herzog of promising a job in Monaco in exchange for leaking information about another legal case involving Sarkozy. In one phone call, Sarkozy said of Azabert, I'll make him move up. I'll help him. In another... Herzog reminded Sarkozy, quote, to say a word for Azibot during a trip to Monaco. Azibot never got the Monaco job, and legal proceedings against Sarkozy have dropped in the case he was seeking information about. But prosecutors have concluded that the clearly stated promise still constitutes corruption under French law, even if the promise wasn't fulfilled. So it's, it's, you know, it's more conversations taking place. They're talking about what to do with this guy. Sarkozy says, yep, we're going to give him a promotion. We're going to move him on up. Kind of like Andrew Cuomo did with that sexual accuser, that sexual harassment accuser. Well, we give, give her a different job. She's an executive assistant. Well, we're going to make her uh, minister of health. Same type of thing here. They're talking about it. Never happens. But Sarkozy wanted to go get information about an investigation into that case, into that allegation, which they ultimately found was uh, was never happened. Right. I mean, he, he never got the job. And so that never moved forward. But the inquiry into the inquiry is what he's sort of uh, under fire for. They argued that the whole case was based on idle chatter between a lawyer and his client. Sarkozy vigorously denied any malicious intention in his offer to help. He told the court that his political life was all about giving people a little help. That is all little help. He complained that the confidentiality of communications between a lawyer and his client was violated by the wiretaps. You have in front of you a man of whom more than 3,700 private conversations have been wiretapped. What did I do to deserve that, Sarkozy said during the trial. Court concluded that the use of the wiretap conversations was legal as long as they helped show evidence of corruption-related offenses. So that's interesting out of France. You know, you sort of have, you have some of these rules that protect attorney-client confidentiality. 
unless there's a, there's an escape hatch, unless there's something that the courts and the laws have deemed so important that it allows you to breach that sacred veil of privilege. And so in Paris, in France, wherever this was taking place, uh, that includes corruption related offenses. So if you're talking with an attorney, so like, for example, in the United States, if you're talking with it, with your client and the client says, Hey, listen, I know you're my lawyer. We're protected by attorney client privilege, right? You say, yes. And they say, okay, well tomorrow I'm going to kill my wife. And you go, Whoa, that's not protected. Okay. You can't tell me that. Are you going to do that? I mean, what are you talking about here? Okay. At that point in time, we got to alert somebody, Hey, and you know, and, and, and make sure that doesn't happen. We got a, a duty to protect life. You can't tell them that you're going to go and, uh, and, and, you know, there's an active, imminent threat. Bar rules are different in different states. So, you know, don't, don't skewer me on this, but the point is if there's something like that, there are exceptions to the attorney client privilege rules. And here in, in France, they're saying it's corruption related offenses. Yeah. He was talking with his lawyer, but he was talking about corruption and you're not allowed to use privilege as a shield to protect you from any other allegations of malfeasance. Sarkozy withdrew from active politics after the 2017 election that was run by Emmanuel Macron remains very popular amid conservative voters, plays a major role behind the scenes. Memoirs were published last year. He'll face the Paris court again later. Talking about uh, millions of dollars. He's always denied any wrongdoing. And that's what's happening around the world. Let's take a look at some questions over from locals.com. We've got one from Jeremy Matrita says, why are federal laws considered a suggestion? Presidents make policies that lay out what laws they wish to enforce and which laws they will ignore. How does this make any sense? Good question, Jeremy. I think that, I think that this is just sort of a fundamental uh, way that our society works. So you've, you know, you've obviously, you've got the three branches of government. You've got the legislative branch, which makes the laws, you've got the executive branch, which enforces the laws, and you have the judicial branch, which says what the law is. And they're all sort of interfacing with one another. You'll see this even on a local level, maybe to give you a better example, you have a bunch of laws on the books locally, and sometimes cops will just decide not to enforce them, right? They're, the, they're an extension of the executive branch. They are out there enforcing the law, just like the president might. And they may just say, well, I'm just not going to enforce that, right? I saw somebody violate that law and it's all right. I got bigger fish to fry. I'm on my way to an investigation. I'm not going to stop and prosecute every single crime. We call that prosecutorial discretion. Same with some of the executive branches, right? You can, you can have certain policies in place. You can just decide, well, we're just not going to enforce marijuana laws. I mean, I know that marijuana is a federal uh, prohibited drug on a federal level. Many states are incriminate or are uh, legalizing it around the country. Arizona is one of them with Prop 207. And so if you're, if you're the president and you are the executive branch and you run the Department of Justice, you may just say, yeah, we're just not prosecuting those types of crimes anymore. Uh, and that, that's sort of executive discretion. Now, I understand your point, you know, sort of should they be, th that is their job. They are the executive branch. They enforce the law. That's their constitutional duty. It says so. And why are they not doing that? And it's because of this discretion that's sort of built into the system. They decide, well, we're not going to do that. You know, we only have so many resources, only so much time in the day, and they're just going to pick and choose which ones that they, they want to elevate. And I don't necessarily know that that's a bad idea. I mean, I think that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of laws on the books. Everything is overly criminalized as it is. We have more laws than anybody knows what to do with. Have you ever looked at the IRS code ever? I, I took a uh, tax law in law school. The books were like this big. It was a nightmare. That's why I'm not a tax lawyer because it was mind numbingly boring and it was insane about how sort of convoluted a lot of these rules are and different people. That, that's sort of by design. Some want to be enforced. Some don't want to be enforced. And I think it's just sort of a natural byproduct of a distribution of power, separate but equal. We want to give them the authority to enforce some laws, not enforce some laws. And you see this sort of as a balancing act between the three branches in this country. Hack Consulting says, since asylum seekers were banned by Trump for good reason, due to problems rampant where they are coming from, perhaps they should shoot, sue Trump for it. Shouldn't win. However, if they're going to bring up this stuff, they may as well go to the courts if they have a problem. Yeah, well, they probably will. I think that, I think that they probably are. I think that they will go to the courts. We have NY Renal ND says, let's reorient ourselves 
immigration policy and law is a responsibility of Congress. Since the pass of the last amnesty, Congress has abdicated, abdicated to the executive branch. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's an excellent point. Well, it's because Congress doesn't do anything. Right. They just they just sort of bicker about. Lord knows what. I really don't know what they do. That's why nobody likes them. Uh, last one. Nope. A couple more. Next up, we've got Hack Consulting says, can you say Wolfgang Deo? Renee misses hearing that with my super chats. LOL. Wolfgang Deo's in the house. So good to see you there, Wolfgang. You know, we're going to be up for reapplication for monetization here this week. Four days, my friends. Maybe we'll get those super chats back. Let's jump to the next one. Last one of the day. Comes over from Jeremy Matrida says an inquiry into the inquiry sounds like a French watching the watchers group. Just saying. Yeah, we need a lot more people inquiring into the inquirers, I think, because I don't trust those doing the inquiries, just like I don't trust trust anybody here doing the inquiries. They're all finding facts that support their own narrative. And I'm really tired of, of a lot of that. Okay. Every time that we see that there's something bad happening in this country, all the politicians, the first thing they do is just go, we need a commission for that. Hmm. Well, I know this is a problem. I know I've been in office for 35 years, but uh, we need a commission. Yeah. Let's put up another commission. Okay. Well, you've been doing this for 35 years. Do you think you might have a solution to the problem that maybe you can tell us about? Cause I don't know what the hell you've been doing for the last couple decades. If you can't come up with a solution, you need to study the issue more. So well, then why don't we just elect people who aren't lifelong politicians, people with new ideas, because the people that are currently in office, apparently they don't have the solutions and they need more commissions, even though we've had commissions for ever now on everything, anything you can think of, we have a commission for it. Maybe we should focus on some solutions. I would like that. All right. So that is it for the show, everybody. I want to thank all those questions that came over from locals.com. These are our tremendous supporters over there. Hack Consulting in the house. Wolfgang Deo in the house. We got Dr. EMB. We got Jen McClellan was here asking some questions. I want to say thanks to Faith Joy and, of course, Ma Fox. Pinky, too, was also in the house. Pinky was one of the earliest subscribers on locals.com. Sach, we've got also got Lead Shed, D Sudlow, Wise One, Office Warrior, Michelle Monique, Paula MK. We got Moleface. We've also got Nadar Blasir, saw him today. Power Man. We've got Craftman 101. We have a bunch of new people signed up over the weekend. Very excited to have you. Welcome to the crew. We've got American underscore Warhawk. We've got Dan Dan O'Man. We've got Dan No Man. We've got Linda913. We've got Cryptomancer. We have Jeff Langston in the house. We got Kate West, Mr. Global Man, Kimber2020, Phantasmagoria, also in the program over at locals.com slash watching the watchers. Phantasmagoria. I like that. That's fun. That's fun to say. So I want to welcome everybody over on our new platform over at locals.com. Thank you so much for supporting the show. You keep the energy here high. You help us build a separate platform. And there's a lot of good people over there. And we're trying to sort of you know build a little bit of a community where we can have conversations that maybe we can't have on the big platforms. And I think Locals is a good place to do that. So thank you for joining up. Look forward to seeing you over there. Welcome to all the newcomers. And if you're not already over there and you're wondering, why would I go over to Locals? Well, you can get some cool stuff. You can get a free copy of my book. Free PDF is available to download over there. Also grab a copy of the slides if you want to download those. Copy of the impeachment party documents. That's going to be going away soon. I've got a replacement that we're going to be shoving in there. Then we've got some existence systems that we're going to talk about if you want to talk about those. I'm also working on beefing this up a little bit. Had an interesting clubhouse that I did with a friend of mine talking about what we can do to help sort of make this more publicly available to people or more accessible, I would say, because this looks like it's a big ball of text on there. Uh, but good links and great people. Those are the real reasons to join us over on locals.com slash watching the watchers. And lastly, but not leastly, I am a criminal defense attorney. If you didn't know that, we help good people who've been charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and in their futures. So if you know anybody in the state of Arizona who has been charged with a crime, we would be honored and humbled if you would refer them to our office. We provide free case evaluations. We can help with anything that involves the police, anything. Uh, if you've been charged with a crime, whether it's a low-level misdemeanor, high-level felony, anything in between, we can work on those. 
uh, DUIs, drugs, domestic violence, traffic offenses, assault cases, anything and uh, sort of anything and everything. Anytime you're in trouble with the law, that's exactly what we do. We have a whole team of people here. We're located in Scottsdale. We would love to see if we could help point you in the right direction. So if you sent somebody to, uh, to us, we'll make sure that they get taken care of and that they are leaving our office in a better place than we found them or than they found us. So that is it for me, everybody. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. Interesting show, interesting energy on the program today, but I enjoyed it. And I want to thank you for joining us on it today. We're going to be back here same time, same place tomorrow, 5 p.m. in Arizona, 4 p.m. in California on the West Coast, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. And for that one Florida man who pays attention, everybody have a very lovely evening. Sleep well, eat a lovely dinner, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Same place, same time. Bye-bye.